now is because our speaker is an individual of few words. That's a few words at a time. But his message is always one of the most stirring and important messages that we libertarians uh, can hear. And over the years, he has continually addressed us to sharpen our thinking and as a small group trying to find our way in the whole gestalt of American politics and American morality and American culture, uh, in order to do something effective, we need all the guidance that we can get. Uh, the speaker was our first presidential candidate. He ran in 1972 when it was really was a tiny group. Uh, he was the author of our Statement of Principles, which is an excellent Statement of Principles that has withstood the test of time. He's a distinguished professor of philosophy and a wise and kind man, John Hospers. Thank you, Ed, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> There are lots of social and political issues on which we've all been involved in discussions at different times. Punishment, welfare, war and peace, mistreatment of children, and so on. On some of these, though not all, there is a distinctively libertarian position. And what, okay, what has struck me uh, many times in trying to develop that position is that I find different views emerging under the same libertarian label. First, there are those who take certain principles, not always the same ones, but principles they believe to be the libertarian ones, and they attempt to rigidly deduce consequences from those, consequences for conduct that apply strictly and without exception. This I'll call pure libertarianism. Pure as the driven snow. There are also those who either interpret the principles more liberally or permit some greater latitude in their application, especially when the pure view departs somewhat from what's vaguely called common sense. <laughs> and this we may call, without being judgmental about it, impure libertarianism. Pure as the driven snow just drifted a bit. Now, what the pure and impure variety say differs from issue to issue. And one could be a pure on one topic and impure on another. And I want to trace through three kinds of examples of this in this, in this talk. Let me begin with an example, though, first. A pure libertarian is very likely to take as an important premise Ayn Rand's statement that no human being's life should be a non-voluntary mortgage on the life of another. This is one of her brief, seminal, mind-blowing statements that changes everything you've ever heard if you, underst if you understand it. And it has vast implications. For instance, that no one may deal with another person by force, for force is opposed to voluntariness. Another implication is that there should be, for instance, no government welfare programs because such programs do cause the life of one person to be mortgaged to another. But now as to what should be done about it, whether this principle should be implemented immediately, that's a matter of disagreement. A pure libertarian would say that government welfare payments are evil and should simply be stopped, period. Stop the non-voluntary mortgage at once. A less pure libertarian would be likely to agree with Rand's principle, but not put the draconian change into effect right away. After all, many people might starve, there'd be riots in the cities, would take more money to quell that than the welfare would cost, or it would be unfair to terminate something on which people's expectations depend and suddenly pull the rug out, and so on. So it's all right to be pure, but don't go pure right away, no matter what the conditions. Right, and that could be applied to different issues like foreign aid and a whole bunch of other things. Now, I want to point one thing out. None of these, neither of these alternatives is a strict consequence of the Randian principle. From the fact that statement that nobody should be a non-voluntary mortgage on another person's life, it doesn't follow that you should stop welfare at once or only that in the ideal system this would be done and none should have started. 
It doesn't really tell you specifically what to do once a mistake has been made and how you correct it. The Randian premise doesn't Im logically imply either that you should put it to practice at once or that you may wait a while and have a waiting period or whatever. So other premises are required to derive that conclusion. There are lots of other examples. The pure libertarian is not likely to accept matching funds during the presidential campaign, for example. <laughs> I remember during my own abortive presidential campaign in 72, I did get one letter which said, just in case you win the election, remember, you must not take one cent of pay. That money was stolen from the taxpayers. The person who wrote this was doubtless a pure libertarian. That is, money not, gi not given with consent is stolen money, and no one should knowingly take stolen goods. A pure libertarian position. But that takes us to the first of the three topics I want to discuss briefly today, consent. The California LP requirement for membership is that you not advocate force or fraud in achieving your goals, except in retaliation. Now, besides being rather vague, I and mean, it doesn't define what fraud is or retaliation, it is negative. A positive one might be what we'd call the principle of consent. Ayn Rand said, and here's again one of those brief, trenchant statements of hers. In any enterprise involving more than one person, said Ayn Rand, the voluntary consent of all parties is required. We constantly employ this principle in our dealings with other people in daily behavior, also in law. If you take someone's belongings without their consent, that's theft. If voluntarily it's given to you, then it's a gift. Consent transforms theft into a gift. Consent is what transforms rape into ordinary sexual intercourse. Similar cases, and this, this libertarian principle is very commonsensical so far. Is it okay for me to play a tape continuously in your bedroom while you're asleep? Without your permission, no, you didn't consent. You might not have okayed it if asked. Is it okay for you to irradiate your dinner guests to, with your new and useless but harmless cancer cure? No, they didn't know about it, and even if they're not harmed, they did not consent. And so on for lots of cases. Consent in law, too, usually does the trick, except in cases like murder, where even if the person consents to be killed, that by our present law doesn't work. That, that indeed may change. At any rate, problems now occur. Consider just this. The murderer didn't consent to be tried or imprisoned. Perhaps we should put in a qualification, unless he violated the rights of others, and then we keep the principle intact, but then we have to go lengthily into the subject of rights and what constitutes a rights violation and whether why force and fraud do constitute that and other things don't and so on. More on this one in a minute. But now a much larger objection emerges too. Not only did the murderer not consent to be punished, he didn't even consent to the system of law by which he was arrested and tried. He didn't consent to the government under which he lives. And neither did you or I. We may have voted for the candidate who came in first, but there are endless aspects of rules that govern us that we didn't consent to or even know about. We may approve of having a legislative, judicial, and executive branch, but I don't remember being asked about this or consenting to it. And neither, of course, did we consent to the majority of the conditions under which we live, for that matter like being born at this place and this time of these parents under these social conditions, or indeed to be born at all. It would be absurd to require consent to all these things, most of which happened totally without our control. We only demand to consent to those conditions or actions which would otherwise be forced on us by other people, thus giving us a choice we would have where we wouldn't have one otherwise. This is the old problem that, in essence, that has divided libertarians from the start. Following the principle of consent strictly, the only pure libertarians would be advocates of anarchism because government violates the principle of consent. And thus, the advocates of liberal government would either be impure libertarians or consigned to be non-libertarians in spite of their saying that they are. Let me mention just in passing two ways to get around this. 
to, to try to get around this. One, what could, one could say we, that there is implicit consent. Now, it's true. There is such a thing as implicit consent, and we sometimes give it. If you knew that your next door neighbor was dropping his excess soil onto your yard from his own, and you saw him do it, and didn't do anything to stop him, not even saying a word, one might well say you implicitly consented to his doing it. If you hire somebody to mow your lawn every Saturday, and you've paid the person regularly for three months every week after he's finished, and today he goes ahead and mows the lawn when you're not at home, and asks for his money, and you say, I didn't consent to it this Saturday, he might well say that you implicitly consented because a pattern has become established every week, even though nothing was stated explicitly. However, most cases of implicit consent aren't that clear cut. And that's the problem with, the, with government. Locke thought that continued residence in a country implied consent. And surely the residents, however, of East Berlin didn't consent to being there when the wall kept them from moving west. And did you implicitly consent to support your children by the act of having them? The law says you did, did you? Or if a man and woman live together for years, though not married, and 10 years later he finds another woman and kicks her out, couldn't she go to court and claim that, although they never discussed this possibility, there was an implicit agreement that the income they earned together belonged to them jointly? It's not entirely clear exactly what the implicit agreement was supposed to be. After all, it was never made explicit. And my only point is that implicit consent is very touchy. You can't just say there was implicit consent. There are plausible cases of it. But in the critical case, consent to government itself, implicit consent doesn't seem to me very plausible at all. Secondly, though, you can take another line. You can agree that the state violates the principle of consent, and then argue that this is not the only principle with which our moral arsenal is stocked. That one of the things we have to do is adjudicate different principles that come into conflict. For instance, the harm principle, like not knowingly harm, uh, harm the others, or the principle of justice, treat others in accord with their desert, or the principle of fair play that Rawls makes so much of, that is the consent principle is not sufficient by itself. Uh, thus, the justice principle might require that murderers be punished in some way, regardless of consent or lack of consent on their part. All right, so that's a second way to go, to say the principle of consent is fine, but it's only one of several ones that have to be integrated with each other. And that's a very promising line which hasn't been sufficiently developed. All right. It's not my purpose, though, to enter into the well-trodden area of government versus limited government versus no government. What I want to do in the remainder of my time is to devote about 10 minutes to each of three topics, uh, illustrating pure and impure libertarianism. I'll assume that there exists some system of law, but I want to ask with specific cases what it should and shouldn't be and why. I'll do this briefly in these three areas. The one, consent, continuing that. Third, the second, privacy, and the third, endangerment or risk. On each of these, there's a lot of conflict within the libertarian camp. And I will try to bring out alternatives rather than try to decide for you what, what I think is correct. The ideal case, one might think, of consent occurs in contract. After all, both parties voluntarily consent. If, they don't, if it's not voluntary, if it's forced, then it's not a, not a valid contract. Uh, but some problems which we hadn't anticipated, as anybody knows who's done contract law, uh, arise even here, where consent doesn't seem to be always necessary. Let's try a couple of simple cases and then get to a more complex one. First example, Smith sells a violin to Jones. Jones thinks it's a Stradivarius, so he pays a lot of money for it. Smith makes no claims for it. Later, Jones discovers it's not a Stradivarius, asks for his money back. No dice. If Smith had made this claim for it, the contract would have been fraudulent. But that's not so in this case. Smith is not obliged to return the money. Second example. White sells Black a house. Black buys it because it's next to a vacant lot, has a nice view. And later White, who also owns the vacant lot, decides to build on it. Black sues him, saying he wouldn't have bought the house except for the vacant lot next door. Black has, I would say, no comeback here. 
the vacant lot was no part of the agreement. An oil company buys land from a farmer at 1,000 per acre. The farmer willingly sells. Later, it turns out that there was oil under the land, and he claims the land was worth at least 10,000 an acre. The oil company concealed this information. But on the other hand, the farmer didn't ask for it. No fraudulent claims were made. There was only a concealment of information, or lack of giving it. On the whole, I'd say there was no contract violation here, though some of us might feel a little bit more uncomfortable about this example than about the earlier ones. Now, three more complicated cases, and I go on. Here's a case uh, <clears throat> which rests on a misunderstanding. A contracts to ship for B a cargo. Um, these three cases are actual ones. I'm quoting getting it from the law books. Uh, on the ship, peerless, and he does. But unknown to either of them, there are two ships with the same name. A shipped on one ship, and B expected the shipment on the other one, and nothing in the contract allowed for this misunderstanding. Now, it had, the case had to be adjudicated somehow, but it couldn't be by, uh, by consent because neither of them consented. I mean, they were, they were just uh, going in different directions with this thing. A somewhat different kind of case. Um, impossibility. A contractor agrees to build an apartment building at a certain location, yet he encounters very swampy terrain. He almost completes the building. It collapses. He starts again. It collapses again. And finally, he throws up his hands and says, look, it's impossible to, to get a building started in this site. The owner of the land then sues him, saying he didn't live up to the contract. And the judge goes along with the contractor, saying that he's excused. Uh, from the terms of the contract because it was impossible to live up to its terms, and impossibility uh, renders the contract void. Though they didn't agree to do this, this was not consented to by both parties, but that's the way the judge decided, and one could ask how else could he really have decided? Penalize someone for not doing the impossible. Here, th thirdly, here's a case, an actual case that occurred around 1890 in Philadelphia. A railroad company ordered a shipment of railroad ties from Scotland via the nearest port, which was Glasgow. The ship, this was in the contract that it had to be shipped from there. The shipper can't ship from Glasgow because of a strike, so he shipped it from Aberdeen instead. And instead of, he absorbed the extra cost of the extra transportation, and he did deliver the ties on time. But the railroad company, who by that, which by that time didn't want the ties anymore, sued for a breach of contract, saying it was in the contract, it had to be shipped from Glasgow, and it wasn't, so the contract has been violated. And the court decided that the agreement, th that the contract had been observed in spite of the fact that the Glasgow clause had not been observed, simply because this was in the presumed intent of putting in Glasgow was uh, to get the ties at the minimum possible time. And that indeed was done. So that, that aspect, that clause in the contract was simply overridden. And this wasn't consent by both parties. But it was, it seems, a wise judicial decision. Now before we leave contract, uh, before we're leaving contract, before we leave the topic of consent, a little bit more. There are pretty hairy cases that make us really wonder. Here's a person with violent epilepsy caused by a brain condition which can be seen on the x-ray. An operation would correct it. If he says yes, no problem. If he says no, libertarians, I think, would still say no problem. We don't operate on him without his consent. Isn't that general the libertarian position? Now, many doctors would favor operating on him anyway, saying he doesn't realize how much freer and happier he'd be after the operation, and he'd lose all this tendency toward violence. The correction of the patient's organic condition will give him more rather than less control over his own behavior, writes Dr. Vernon Mark in, the, uh, in an article called Brain Surgery and Aggressive Epileptics. It enhances and does not diminish his, dim his dignity and humanity. I think the libertarian position so far is don't operate even though we all know he'd be happier or better off after the surgery. It's for him to decide. 
Okay, so far so good, or maybe not so good yet. But now try this. I know of this, the following case. Of a pedestrian who suffered extensive brain damage when the car ran over his head. The insurance company contacted him and he agreed to settle the case for $1,000. But he didn't have much of a brain left with which to make the decision. <laughs> Would a pure libertarian still say, well, it was his decision and he consented, so that's final. And then a person may be, considering other cases, insane, literally not know what he's doing, or he might just be extremely stupid and not able to anticipate or control events in his life. When I go through the various legal definitions of insanity, I keep, always keep thinking that they all apply to stupidity just as well. <laughs> and what if somebody who suffers from uh, senility or advanced Alzheimer's disease, and here people are declared mentally incompetent without their consent, and now libertarians are right to object to this in lots of cases. Injustice is done. People lose their bank account, their homes, their rights under the law because the judge makes a declaration. But then there are also cases, which we mustn't just quickly align with the first ones, where the person literally has no idea who or what he or she is and can't make any decision any more than a newborn infant can. The idea of letting one person make a judgment about the disposition of another person's fate is very upsetting to libertarians. It strikes at the vital center of this personal responsibility concept. But what if there isn't much of a bee to make a decision about his or her life? One does this all the time in the case of small children. Parents protect them from danger by force if necessary. The old lady has rather lost her moorings and she sits alone in her apartment and she thinks she's somewhere else and she doesn't recognize her children and on her own she couldn't possibly survive, but she won't leave. She wants to stay in her house for 40 years, but there's no way to enable her to do this. If others don't make a decision for her, she dies. There are lots of cases of this kind. I'll omit some of the more interesting ones for the sake of just uh, getting on with the, with the next part. I'll come back to consent in connection with the other two, but meanwhile, a related thing, not quite the same, where again there's a difference between pure and impure, and it doesn't always operate in the same way. Let's talk a little bit about privacy. It's central to libertarian thought, although the term may not be often mentioned. The Constitution doesn't mention privacy at all, but some of the amendments in the Bill of Rights do address it. The First Amendment protects free association, protecting your private space against those who would invade it. The Third Amendment protects against quartering of soldiers in private homes. The Fourth Amendment protects privacy very clearly by prohibiting unreasonable searches and seizures, and so on. The importance of privacy, having some kind of space that is our own and nobody else's, it's in intricately bound up with our dignity as human beings, the respect owed by people to each other. Charles Freed, in his book, Anatomy of Values, writes this, these two sentences. Privacy provides us with a context for our most significant ends, like love, trust, friendship, respect. It's a necessary element in these relations. Without privacy, they're inconceivable. Threat to privacy is a threat to our integrity as persons, and privacy is a necessary atmosphere for these attitudes and actions, as oxygen is for combustion, unquote. Now, there is some disagreement as to how privacy should be defined. Some authors of legal textbooks believe that what defines privacy is that there are limits to the access others should have to perceiving you. For instance, somebody may not, without your consent, take a picture of you and then feature it on the cover of a magazine the following week. This is an invasion of your privacy. More usually, however, privacy is defined in different terms, in terms of information about you, when, about when uh, you may not want others to possess. Uh, things you don't want other people to know unless you give them permission. Now, invasion of privacy must be distinguished from libel and slander, that is defamation. In defamation, a person must purposely and maliciously say or write something false about you and cause you damage. In invasion of privacy, nothing false need be said. For example, a millionaire tried in Los Angeles to keep his wife's suicide out of the newspapers. The newspapers said no because they said news comes first. A father's six-year-old daughter was mangled by a passing car. He tried to keep the picture out of the paper. News comes first. It didn't succeed. 
But six years later, when an organization devoted to automotive safety used the same picture on a poster to warn pedestrians, he sued them for invasion of privacy and won. Now, some would say that privacy should be legally protected only when it's already covered by another kind of law, namely protecting property. Uh, thus, your, someone can examine your private papers by breaking into your home, and so on. I doubt, however, that this will do. You can now find the contents of confidential papers and oral conversations without ever coming on somebody else's premises. You can tap their phone without, uh, without the phone being off the hook. You can hear what's going on in the, uh, in the house by being many, many feet outside. And in fact, Judge uh, <clears throat> John Marshall, first justice of the Supreme Court, remarked the following in 1820. Ways will one day be developed by the government without removing papers from secret drawers, they will be able to reproduce them in court and will be enabled to expose the most intimate occurrences of the home. Advances in psycho the psycholo psychological and related sciences will bring means of exploring unexpressed beliefs and thoughts and emotions. Can it be that the Constitution affords no protection against such invasion of individual security? That's what he asked 150 years ago. Now, the main thing that places in, uh, in legal limitations on your privacy is the safety of others. Being subjected to electronic surveillance is surely an invasion of your privacy, perhaps as much as having the IRS uh, read your checks at the bank. Uh, yet it's legally approved to some degree, depending on the state of the US that you live in, if your telephone is tapped, your house is bugged by hidden electronic equipment, so everything is overheard, surely it's a clear violation of, 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 of privacy. Uh, but before we get to a, and that in the pure libertarian position, one pure libertarian position, I'll outline another one in a second, uh, is that uh, this is always an admissible invasion of privacy. However, uh, suppose that your life hung in the balance. Uh, there was a plot to murder you, and the only way to uncover the people who were doing it would be to tap their phone. Would you, uh, granted that's maybe an extreme situation, but you might consider your life more valuable than their privacy and vote in favor of the surveillance. I don't know. The, this, is, this is where the pure and impure uh, certainly get distinguished. But let's see for a minute, before we leave this topic, how privacy operates in the legal system. It's a chaos right now. You can find out who's in jail by, dealing, by dialing a certain phone number. You can find out what they're accused of when they're to appear in court. That's public information. Even though they don't want it and they don't consent, that's public. It's considered important for anyone who wants this information can have it, and it helps guarantee against secret trials. It's a little bit different with psychiatric information. You want to find someone, someone who's in a, a mental institution, it's not that easy as a rule. What a defendant says to his attorney is legally privileged. It's protected. He can confess to murders and the attorney keeps quiet. His position is like that of the priest and confessor. What's more controversial is whether the relation between physician and patient should be like that. And that's still in controversy today. New York was the first state in 1828 to guarantee the confidentiality of the physician-patient relationship. The theory was, if the patient was not guaranteed that his communication with his doctor would be kept confidential by the doctor, the patient would then sh stay away from doctors and his health might suffer. That view, 1828, was never more appropriate than in today's controversy about requiring doctors to report AIDS cases. However, in 34 states, the physician-patient communication is privileged. The doctor may not reveal in court what he learned from the patient professionally. And so when a passenger in a New York taxi cab falsely claimed whiplash and sued the taxi cab company, the physician was not permitted to testify, although one sentence from him would have, turned, would have thrown out the whole case. That sentence was, I've been treating this man for sciatica for three years. But in, in New York, the relation between patient and his psychologist is also privileged. In New York, dentists are privileged as well. None of them are in Arkansas, but nurses are privileged there. 
In New Jersey, physicians are not privileged at all, and they must answer court questions, but newspaper reporters are privileged and don't have to. In Georgia and Tennessee, physicians must tell all about their patients in court, but psychologists may not do so, and so on. Now, a, a minute more on privacy. I'm condensing this. A politician can claim, can't claim invasion of privacy because he sought and asked for the job which involves publicity. He can sue for libel if somebody says something false about him, but not if they don't. But here's a former opera superstar whose voice has declined with the years and she no longer wants to be listened to and she sings only behind closed doors and her neighbor trains an amplifier on her apartment door and listens and records and the theme of it is she ain't what she used to be. Now, this may all be true. Question now, are you quite sure that you want her to have no recourse against such things? Perhaps not. Perhaps her life is fair game for others. It hardly seems fair to her. You can, of course, say those are the breaks, but could you say that too if she'd been, you could say that too if she'd been stolen from, raped, or murdered. The question is, should she have legal protection? And on this privacy issue, pure libertarians can take two opposed views, depending on whose interests they most wish to protect. If you have a right to privacy, the person who invades it, the privacy of the opera star is a rights violator. You protect a person's privacy, and no one may cross that invisible line. It's sacred. On the other hand, you might see the issue from the other person's angle. He can say whatever he likes about the opera star. He can even record her decaying voice without her permission and sell the unauthorized recordings. And all these are a part of his freedom to act in accordance with his own judgment. And if her feelings are hurt and her previous privacy invaded, well, that's tough luck. The impure variety will, as always, say that the answer lies somewhere in between. It depends on the individual case and so on. Exactly where, you can't state in advance. You have to learn the specific details of the individual case before you take a position, make a judgment. And this is messy, and the truth often is messy, but that's the line the impure libertarian will take on this type of case. Not one extreme, or for that matter, the other one. This is unsatisfying to pure libertarians, but anyway, that's, I think that, that's the way the ball bounces on this issue. Finally, one, the, the third topic, risk and endangerment. To live at all is a risk. You take a risk when you cross the street. We don't sue people for risks, we sue them for damages when damage or injury has occurred. To sue or prosecute for what might have happened but didn't would fill the court dockets much more than they're filled now, besides being impractical, we'd also consider it improper procedure. In morality, we may be to blame for creating risks, but just the risk alone isn't enough to receive damages. Or so the pure libertarian says. No fine and no punishment unless damage or injury has actually been inflicted. At least I know some people who view themselves as pure libertarians, and that's, that's, that's the watchword. The impure libertarian, however, may say, not so fast. It should also be punishable to engage in very dangerous activities. Even though you may not sue for this, there should be laws against such behavior. Now, it may seem as if this move, uh, by this move, we're muddying the clear waters of our thought. Aren't we opening the floodgates to almost everything when we say that not only damage or actual injury, but the danger or risk of it should be prohibited? Maybe so, our instincts certainly go along here so far with the pure libertarian. We don't want to ban dangerous activities. I mean, a, a woman is uh, like mountain climbing. A woman is walking along the street, there's a man following her, she turns the corner, he follows her, she turns another corner, he follows her again. She'd like to call the police on him for on what charge? I mean, harassment, there hasn't been any yet, besides libertarians don't like alas, harassment laws. Uh, he has the same rights to walk the streets that she has. Maybe he was going the same way. Maybe he was just going to ask her for the time. Who knows? No, nothing has happened yet. No charge so far. But let's think about this one. It's illegal to drive on the left side of the road. You can be arrested for doing it on a two-lane highway in, in the States. Or to drive 100 miles per hour in a residential zone. To do these things is very, very risky, so they're prohibited. And 
I think most people are sort of glad they are. Would you really prefer it if starting today people could drive on whatever side of the road they pleased? <laughs> Aren't you glad that if the bridge is out, there has to be a warning of this, and that there have to be signs at railroad crossings, and that the use of dangerous but necessary chemicals like those in fumigation are rigidly controlled, uh, and that some like the plastic bombs that cause the destruction of Pan Am 103 are prohibited entirely? And there's also this question, what if at unsuccessful attempts he planted the bomb, but it didn't go off. Under today's law, he can be arrested for attempt. Now, many pure libertarians, like Randy Barnett, do not believe in laws against uh, prohibiting attempts. They say, if no harm is done, then forget about it. But of course, you may pre by preventing it now, you may prevent a successful attack later. Well, all right, that may be the case. What about somebody who shoots another, but unknown to him, somebody has substituted blanks for real bullets, so no harm is done? was well, certainly an attempt. And the question now is, should attempts be uh, prohibited? I mean, the pure libertarian is inclined to say no, like Barnett, and impure to say yes, they should be, because of what they can prevent later. Similarly with conspiracy. Here's a conspiracy to commit a crime. You plan a crime, like Charles Manson, without actually wielding the knife. You inspire those who do or you're the victim of a conspiracy to kill you. You didn't happen to be around just at that moment, so the conspiracy failed. Uh, would you rather have your would-be assailants arrested or wait for them to try again? There's all kinds of, of uh, problems here. Uh, and you see, I want to keep your mind sort of divided between saying, yes, risks should be prohibited, certain risks if they're very extreme, and by saying no, you only punish for actual events. One or two more cases, and then I'll close. Having guns is dangerous. You might shoot somebody in haste or while drunk, and somebody might take your gun from you and do it to you, or a child might use it, all the familiar stuff. But of course, this is also a double-edged knife. If someone is threatening to use force against you, threatening that person with a gun may be the only way to stop him from killing you. And it's for that reason that the Founding Fathers guaranteed the right to bear arms. Nobody should be a sitting duck in the faces of some face of someone else's violence. That's the situation. That still leaves most questions unanswered. You have a right to keep and bear arms. Only in your home or anywhere you happen to go? On someone else's property, perhaps? And which arms may we have? Does the Constitution entitle you to a Saturday night special or a semi-automatic or just some means to defend yourself? Maybe just a butcher knife? Maybe just a karate chop? It doesn't say. Is it OK to make small nuclear bombs in your basement? <laughs> Carry them around maybe in your briefcase so that in case someone bothers you too much, you can eliminate him immediately? <laughs> I think the pure libertarian position is this. You can have any weapon provided you use it defensively. I mean, they have mentioned this, uh, several have mentioned this to me. I'll be about three minutes more. Uh, but you may, use, uh, may not use any weapon, not even a butcher knife, offensively. Of course, you have to be quite sure what's to count as defensive and offensive, and unfortunately, the same things that can be used for defense can also be used for offense, and that's very, very embarrassing, and it makes things very, very difficult. Anyway, that's the... The pure line, and we also have this with product liability cases, uh, is the Pinto too dangerous to be allowed on the road, and so on and so on. Lots of cases of that kind, but I conclude. Here's one example, I'll comment on it and then conclude. This is from a case history. Sometimes I think that what I really want to do is kill people and drink their blood. Dr. Alan Wolf looked at the young man in the chair. The face was round and soft and innocent looking like that of a baby but the body had the powerful shoulders of a college wrestler. There was no doubt that Hal Crane had the strength to carry out his fantasy. Any people in particular? Uh, girls about my age, in the early 20s. But nobody you know. That's right, just people I see getting off a bus. I have a tremendous urge to stick a knife into them and feel the blood on my hands. But you've never done this. No, but I might. Dr. Wolf considered him a paranoid schizophrenic who might act out his fantasies. He was a walking time bomb. Would you be willing to take my advice and put yourself in a hospital for a little while? 
I won't do that. I won't be locked up like an animal. But you don't really want to hurt other people, do you? I guess not. I haven't done anything yet. But you might, he said. You might kill someone. Well, that's just the chance people will have to take, isn't it? <laughs> I, I told you I'm not going to let myself be locked up like an animal, and that's it. I have several comments on this. Just one will do. Let's suppose for a minute that psychotherapy would resolve Crane's internal conflict and cure his condition, but that he won't consent to it. Are we perhaps entitled to use it on him anyway, for his sake and for ours? Remember, if he's cured, he saves himself and who knows how many others who might be his victims. The pure libertarian says, no, we may not do it. We can't even offer him the choice psychotherapy or detention. He'd be foolish to turn it down, of course, but if he does, he still has no, we still have no right to impose it on him against his will, not even if what we demand is one hour of therapy a week, and that no matter how dangerous he is. That's the pure libertarian view. He wants it all, though. No psychotherapy and no detention. Should we give him all of that, thus protecting him by endangering ourselves? That's the question. How do you balance danger to us against freedom for him. Now, I raise these questions, including here, not to really to get you to accept certain solutions, but to get you in the habit of viewing an issue in its full complexity before opting for some neat formula that sounds attractive and that will make thought unnecessary after that. This is a false comfort I don't want to leave. I want you to feel uncomfortable about these cases, especially when you push them to borderline areas, and not to give in to the tremendous temptation to refer all specific questions to some slogan. It's a pity that reality defies our neat and tidy categories, but that's the way reality is, and premature assurance, premature codification into a slogan, and then using the slogan to obtain quick converts, that only gives us fair weather friends anyway. Those who give verbal assent and then don't try to understand add nothing. They may find an inadequately comprehended slogan attractive on Tuesday and then drop it for another inadequately comprehended slogan on Wednesday. There is no shortcut. We have to be careful. We have to be always probing, always trying to think of counterexamples to facile and tempting formulations. And this will help us not only to be thorough, but to be undeviatingly honest in what we present and what we say. Only then will our movement become what Anatole France once described in another context as a moment in the conscience of the human race. Thank you very much.